Uh, my name is Michael Otsuka, and I'm actually filling in for Alex Forhuva as the chair of this event. Alex wasn't able to, uh, to, 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 to chair the event. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy in the same department, the philosophy department as Alex, and I specialize in moral and political philosophy. So the topic of today is the ethics of parenthood, and we have three excellent speakers who will be engaged in a dialogue about various topics having to do with the value of childhood, uh, child's rights. That's what we'll be spending about the first half hour on. And then the second half hour will be on the interaction between the rights of children and the rights of parents. So I might just say a little bit more about the particular topics uh, when we launch the first session. Um, but uh, what I wanna do is, is first, uh, just mention that there will be 15 minutes. We'll make sure that there are at least 15 minutes at the end of this webinar uh, between 7 and 7.15 uh, for us to engage with your own questions. And so please, at any point in time, just type a question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then we'll get your questions at that point. And up until that point, we're going to try to have as much of an informal dialogue among the three speakers as possible. They might ask each other questions. Um, and uh, let me just uh, introduce the three speakers. So um, Anka uh, Geyush is an assistant professor in the political science department at the Central European University in Vienna. Her work addresses questions related to children's rights, parental rights, and the value of childhood, quality of opportunity, and gender justice. And, She's currently working on a monograph on justice and child rearing, as well as a book on surrogacy. Uh, Matthew Liao is a director of the Center for Bioethics um, it, and uh, an affiliate of the Department of Philosophy at New York University. Um, he's written a book called The Right to be Loved, in which he argues that children have a right to be loved and investigates questions as whether children are rights holders, what grounds are right to be loved, and whether love is an appropriate object of a right. Um, he's also worked on the ethics of parental love pills, which is a bit of an intriguing topic we might want to ask him about. Um, finally, Patrick Tomlin is a professor in the philosophy department at the University of Warwick. Um, much of his work is outside of this particular topic, um, so he may actually be a bit more of a, a, a questioner than someone who speaks of the other two speakers. Um, but in addition to his work on such things as the ethics of war and self-defense, um, he's written on children's well-being and the value of childhood and has addressed the question of who should be responsible for bearing the costs of those things children are owed. Now, as I mentioned a while ago, um, we're going to divide into two uh, parts. Part one for about the next half hour will be on the value of childhood and children's rights. Um, so, so far as the value of childhood is concerned, I mean, among the questions that they might uh, engage, but it's up to them is what type of value does childhood in particular have? Um, events in childhood shape the adults we become, but is that the only reason to care about childhood? Or does a good childhood matter for its own sake? Is there something special about childhood? What's good about childhood? And then we'll turn after discussing the value of childhood to a discussion of what rights children have and what grounds their rights, uh, how these rights might be distinctive from the rights that adults have, which will be the second topic, the second half hour on the interaction between the rights of children and the rights of parents. And the aim of the second half hour is to discuss how children's rights can conflict with parents' rights and how these conflicts should be resolved. So uh, what, what I wanna do is turn now to the first question, uh, starting with a discussion of the value of childhood. Now, Anka and Patrick have worked on this topic in particular. And so perhaps, Anka, if I could invite you to um, begin by saying a few words about the value of childhood, and then it, the other speakers should, should feel free to jump in at any point to ask questions, raise challenges, and the like. So, so Anka, do you want to start things off? Sure. Thanks a lot for organizing this and, and for having us here. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this exchange. And uh, it's great you're starting with the question of the value of childhood, which is one of my pet subjects. I really 
like thinking about this. So I, I've been mostly thinking about the value of childhoods for the children, while children, and for the human being in general, the prudential value of childhood. And um, I think often in, in philosophy, the value, the prudential value of childhood is portrayed in terms of, as you said, Mike, uh, um, instrumental value, uh, the time when you are uh, about to become or to reach the, the phase of your life where, where uh, most prudential value is located. And also in terms of uh, the final value of hedonic uh, experiences. But I think that a lot less, less attention has been paid to the ways in which children can enjoy um, things that we may characterize as accomplishments or as things that are prudentially value even on a, on a, let's say, objective list account of what makes people's life go well. And I'm quite convinced by those people who have looked, paid close attention to children and, uh, and their creativity and who say that um, at least before a certain age, which is sometimes identified as the onset of puberty, Children are quite good at, as engage, at engaging in activities that we usually think make people's lives go better for them when they engage in them, irrespective of the products and product that they, they realize when engaging in those activities. So, for instance, people who do philosophy with children often say that for most people who will never become uh, professional philosophers, the time in your life uh, when, when you are most able to see philosophical questions and show genuine interest in them, and ask questions that are interesting is a childhood up to puberty. Then something happens apparently and we lose that kind of curiosity and, and broad interest in connecting issues and in asking questions about value and about knowledge and about metaphysics. Again, with the exception of some people who pursue philosophy lifelong. Um, a similar thing is said about philosophy, uh, about children and art. So many artists in the past hundred years at least uh, started to look and take seriously children's art and to be very impressed by, by our creativity when it comes to art, again, up to a certain age. And again, there the claim is quite similar. Unless you go on to have art as a hobby or as a profession for your life, the time in your life when you're most likely to enjoy the pursuit of aesthetic value is your childhood. Now, in the case of philosophy, the, nobody claims that children are uh, particularly good at uh, getting to great philosophical results, obviously not. So the idea is not that they have the ability to pursue a particular question in detail and see how it's connected to other questions and, and to the kind of work that professional philosophers do. The claim is only that they are asking very good questions and they are very receptive to, to understanding what is behind their question and to connecting perhaps with other questions and discussing philosophical issues. When it comes to arts, I think the claim is a bit more ambitious. Some people say that, pe that children sometimes create art that is better on average than what they are likely to create later on, should they still be even interested in drawing or painting. Um, and then there is a lot of neurobiological literature showing how as knowers, while, while children, we're not just very fast learners of languages or the kinds of things that everybody would think of when, when thinking about children, but generally we, we acquire knowledge in a way that is not um, that it's a lot more active, the process that it's a lot more active than, than it has been traditionally portrayed. So if you think that a life uh, spent uh, to a large extent on asking philosophical questions and learning very fast lots of things and, uh, and being uh, artistically creative is a life well lived, and if it's true that during childhood we have a window of opportunity of, of doing these things with pleasure a lot more than we are likely to do them as adults, then it looks to me that childhood is a really privileged time in life in which, um, um, well, we have this opportunity to, to uh, uh, go for, uh, for philosophical, artistic, and epistemic kind of activities. And of course, it's a very interesting question to figure out whether this window, this window is closing later on because of how society is organized or whether there are some biological facts that explain why children are so receptive to, to art, philosophy, and uh, knowledge in general, or whether it's just the fact of being very new to the world and excited because things are new to you. But um, at least until and unless we discover ways to, to make people qua adults enjoy these pursuits, I think it's very important to acknowledge that childhood is an important phase in life for, uh, for the well-being of the whole human being, if we think that these types of activities are accomplishments and are important contributors to well-being. 
Thank you very much. Um, just raises a lot of questions. That, um, unfortunately, I'm sure um, uh, we don't have time to explore all of them. But um, so one question I have is, um, is there something about art and philosophy as opposed to other, I suppose, creative and intellectual disciplines, which um, children are distinctively good at? Um, and I'm, and that, I'm thinking, and, and then the other question is, you mentioned that some people some children have more artistic ability as children than lose them as parents. But presumably, you know, the, the um, maybe I'm just speaking from a, an adult centric point of view, but the greatest artistic and philosophical accomplishments are from um, adults. Um, and so is there some connection with their childhood that great artists, accomplished philosophers retain they, they're able to develop their um, artistic or philosophical abilities, but, but do they also need to retain some sort of connection, say, with their perspective, their way of seeing the world as a, as a, as a child, do you think? Well, as you said, lot, lots of questions. And uh, so for the last question, yes, one is tempted to say yes, and there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a lots of stories about uh, adult creative, creativity during adulthood having something to do with an ability to be childlike, not childish, but childlike. But I, I really don't know about this. So I never studied this in any kind of systematic way to see whether this is just a myth or um, there is more to it. Um, the first question is fascinating. Why, why there is so much association between childhood and um, visual arts, but not other kinds of arts. And I really don't know whether this is, a, this is just a, a a function of uh, adults giving kids uh, pencils and colors more than uh, than playing instruments or um, asking them to tell stories, or whether the kind of um, perseverance you know in order you need in order to write stories or even to make up stories or to play an instrument um, is uh, is beyond the reach of children in a way in which. Um, a sensitivity for color and light, whatever you need to, to, to create visually beautiful things is not, I, I really don't know. But with respect to philosophy and children, so um, we know that children can paint beautiful things because we give them colors and we see that sometimes they paint beautiful things. But with philosophy and children from, from what I've read is not like the most interesting philosophical questions that children ask or things that, they, that sound philosophical and they say come up in, a, in an organized setting of doing philosophy with children. Very often the most interesting things are just reported by parents who in everyday conversations with their children in trying to sort out dilemmas, practical dilemmas of how to accommodate several people's conflict in interest, for instance, they hear these kinds of comments and questions from their children and they report them. And sometimes they are the most interesting ones, which I think it's an indication that um, there is a tendency in children to actually be curious about values and about moral reasoning, at least. These are, these are the kinds of things that I was mostly interested in, as opposed to metaphysical comments or epistemic questions. And uh, then it may be a matter of uh, how open we are to listening to them in a non-condescending way and actually understanding what it is that they are saying, um, ra rather than uh, creating the environment in which they can bring to the fore this type of creativity. Right, thanks. So Matthew, do you want to um, jump in at this point and you can talk about the value of childhood, what's distinctive about childhood. If you want, you can move on to the issue of um, children's rights um, and it also welcome to a dialogue between among the three of you. So. Um, um, and or in Patrick as well, either either of you, if you would jump in at this point and uh, um, say a few words. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, go ahead. Well I, well, I think I can kind of maybe take a slight step back and, and describe um, some different forms of value that we might think childhood possesses and then some different accounts that we might have, like broad accounts that we might have of what makes childhood valuable or in what ways it's valuable and then I can kind of compare Anka's view to uh, maybe a view that I'm tempted by although I find all of the views have got problems so when we talk about the value of childhood Anka talked about the prudential value of childhood so that's the idea of how valuable is the childhood for the person who lives the childhood now it might be that childhood is less 
it's valuable than adulthood, say, in that sense. So it might be better for you to be an adult than to be a child. But that doesn't mean that childhood isn't valuable. For a start, it's, it might be more valuable, for example, than not existing. So being a child might be an absolutely brilliant thing to be. It might just be that being an adult is even better. That's one possible view. But we shouldn't mistake the idea of saying, you know, childhood is less valuable than adult for the idea that childhood is bad for you it's, it's it still could be good for you maybe just not as good as being an adult for example um but also childhood can have other forms of value so my life is much better for the fact that i have my children in it um and so you know as an adult my life is made valuable by childhood just not necessarily my own childhood so we, we shouldn't mistake thinking of the value of childhood as only being uh, about this prudential question about how good the childhood is for the child. So that's just some different forms of value generally what we might think about um, when we're thinking about childhood. It might not be only about how good it is for the child. But then let's just think about the value that childhood has at, for the for the person that lives the childhood. Now it might be that it's, it's really important preparation time for being an adult and th that is part of what it is. When we talk about the things that children are owed, some of the things that they're owed are things that prepare them for later life, not just the things that make their childhood go well as a child. So if I think about the things I do with my children, I, you know, I've just been playing football uh, in the garden and I think that was a kind of, this is nice right now. Uh, and now he's downstairs doing some maths and I think that might be a bit more about you know, <laughs> things that will be useful to him later on. And so, you know, that we, we sort of divide not cleanly, but there are things that we do that we think are preparing for later life and things that are good for the children now. Um, and a good childhood probably consists in having both of those things. Um, but those things can also come into conflict. So sometimes we might have to sort of weigh this preparation role in childhood versus this kind of enjoying the childhood in the moment kind of thing. Now, when we think about what's making a child's life go well, qua child rather than say qua being prepared for being an adult there are various accounts available to us and one is that whatever account we have for adult well-being should also apply to children um and i think this is a, anka has a version of this view but she has a kind of revisionist version of this view so anka thinks that whatever makes an adult's life go well also makes a child's life go well but she thinks we've not paid enough attention this was the kind of gist of her comments i take it we've not paid enough attention to things that children can do or at goods that they can access that they're actually really good at accessing and that make their lives go very well on this kind of what we might call unified account where we just have one account of well-being for children and adults and children are actually doing better than we might think on that measure now i think a lot of what anka says i would agree with but I just think there are the downsides of being a child if we measure being a child in the same way are so massive that I think if we have the same account for children and adults, children's lives, it turns out, are not going very well. So just basically because I think autonomy matters. So I think it, I think your life goes worse when you are controlled by other people, when you don't have much freedom, like as an adult. and that really characterizes children's lives they're giving very little freedom now that might be in their own interests but the fact that they're the kind of beings who need that level of control if we were comparing them to an adult say we'd think that person's life wasn't going very well so just imagine your own life but when you're told when to get up you're told where to be you're told what to wear often uh, you're told you know you have to go to this educational establishment now and you have to do this now and now it's time for lunch and now you've got to get in the car and you can't cross the street on your own and all these things that we tell small children at least that they can and can't do and they need to do them under supervision if that were an adult you might think that that person's life is going badly now i am tempted to say that that children's lives aren't going badly because not because like anchor i think we should like revise how we think of children but just because i think we should revise our accounts of well-being i think accounts of well-being possibly should be sort of tailored to the kind of thing we are so what makes my life go well and why autonomy matters to how well my life is going is because i have a certain set of capacities i don't think autonomy matters to 
I don't know, an oyster, how well an oyster's life is going or a cat's life is going in the same way because it doesn't have the same capacities. And similarly, children don't have the same capacities. So we might need a new account of well-being that reflects children's lives and what actually makes a childhood go well, rather than trying to sort of uh, refocus and think about ways that children's lives go well under the kind of adult theory of well-being. Now, so that's why I think we might be attracted to this dual account where we have a separate account of, in, of, of the well-being or interests of children and adults. But very, very briefly, I'll just say why I think that account is going to be problematic. So I am tempted by this dual account, but I also think that it leads to some um, sort of troubling implications in certain kinds of cases. So imagine you could... Um, Imagine, Mike, that we were trying to establish whether something I do to you is good or bad for you, right? So I've got a pill that I want to give you, um, and we're trying to work out whether or not that pill will be good or bad for you. The way we would do that standardly is to compare your well-being across a single account of your well-being and see how you would fare if I gave you the pill versus if I didn't, right? So that's how we would establish whether something is good or bad for you. Now, imagine that my view that children and adults should have separate accounts of well-being applied to them is correct. It would have this implication. I've got two pills. I've got one that can speed up my child's development so that he won't, um, basically won't have a childhood. And I've got one that will slow down his development so that he'll permanently be a child. Now, I think on the dual account, it's going to turn out that those, neither of those pills will be good or bad for him because there's simply no single account of well-being that applies across the child and the adult that would explain whether a pill is good or bad for him. And that seems to me very problematic. And obviously, intuitively, I think the vast majority of us are going to think both those pills would be bad for him, that it's good to be a child, but it's also good not to stay as a child. And so I think we might need a theory of an overarching theory of kind of lifetime well-being that explains why it's good for you to have different accounts of well-being apply to you at different times. Now, Anke is sort of looking very puzzled and problem thinks this is problematic, and I agree it's going to be tricky to work out why that would be. I also think here, though, we need to be cautious because my intuitive views are that it's good to be a child for about the amount of time that it just so happens that we are children. Now, we should always be skeptical of, you know, status quo bias, and we should always be skeptical of, I mean, imagine Mother Nature has just sorted it out so that we're actually living our very best lives. That, well, there's no reason to think that that would be the best time. So our intuitions here are probably pulled by the fact that we experience childhood for a certain amount of time, and therefore we kind of think it's good to have it for roughly that amount of time, but I'm skeptical about the intuitions. So that's where I've got to, is basically I'm puzzled by the whole thing. Um, but very briefly, my message is we can either have this single account, but on the single account, it looks like children's lives are going badly, or we can have the dual account, but the dual account can't explain why it's bad to speed up someone's childhood or why it's bad to keep someone permanently as a child. Thanks very much. It's fascinating. Um, so I think, I think it's all right for us to continue discussing things other than children's rights uh, up until maybe... Um, half past the hour and we make sure we have the, the second hour, second half of the hour to, to talk about children's rights and the way parents and children's rights interact, if that's all right. Um, Anka, do you want to um, respond to um, Patrick? Uh, yeah, I, I do. And uh, yeah, there's a lot in what Patrick said and there's a, there'll be a lot to, to have a really interesting discussion about. I want to say that I agree with him that part of our disagreement has to do with the fact that uh, my account of well-being is unified and this has a lot to do with the fact that I quite don't quite really understand what it means to have separate accounts of well-being for separate kinds of creatures. Of course, different kinds of creatures are going to have their well-being advanced by different particular precise types of resources or, or events. But I think that what ultimately matters for well-being, it must be the same whether you are a child, a grown-up, an oyster, or a tree, if a tree can have well-being. Um, so this is one, it's like a limit of my understanding of what it really means to have different accounts of well-being for different kinds of creatures. And another source may be the, my, my um, 
putting less weight on the on the value of autonomy for for uh, how well your life goes for you. But it's also I think it, some of the disagreement may also come from the fact that we are we are having very sketchy images of what it means to be a child and maybe very idealized images of what it means to be an adult. Adults' lives are also very regimented and we are being told perhaps not what to wear anymore, although I guess there are countries where people are told what to wear as well, uh, but when to get up and where to go and you know most of the things on the list that you have given us earlier. And also interestingly, I think that the good childhood, the, the one that I look at thinking a good one, realistic childhood, the one I look at when I'm trying to think what is the prudential value of childhood, is one that is good to some extent in virtue of children being given more freedom and if you want more space to exercise their personal autonomy. So children don't usually ask interesting questions or engage in creative activities when they are micromanaged every second of their lives. Um, and I think this may be a nice uh, actually segue into the discussion of children's rights and what is, what is um, owed to children. Right, so this might be a good time to bring Matthew in. I mean, first of all, I invite you to um, comment on anything that's been said so far, and also just to launch into a discussion of children's rights. Yeah, sure. So uh, th thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I have just sort of been really enjoying the conversation between Anka and Patrick. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. Like one is, um, uh, I very much agree with Anka, um, and I might try to expand her examples a bit more. So, you know, we always, like, people always say that uh, children are like sponges, right? They absorb so many things. And there, there's a new, you know, there's sort of a biological basis for that. We know that there's neuroplasticity. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, neurons that are still being formed and things like that, being connected up, yeah, and then especially all the way through, like, adolescence. Um, and so, uh, and that explains uh, a lot of sort of like uh, the children's ability to acquire a lot of uh, uh, skills and, you know, things very fast. Um, and I think not just philosophy or art, but, you know, we talk about language, for example, we talk about gymna like just take gymnastics, for example, <laughs> like young children are way much better, you know, like better in doing a bunch of things than compared to adults. Um, and so there, uh, and uh, so that, you know, so I agree with Anka. I think that uh, a lot of this can be explained through brain development and sort of just neurobiology, like how humans develop. Um, I like what uh, Patrick was saying. Uh, and, you know, that, you know, sometimes maybe we need to look at the whole process as well. And one of the things I think about, you know, sort of the value of childhood, and this is sort of really Anka and Patrick's expertise, but I, it reminds me of sort of like, so we think, um, you know, there's something nice about being uh, sort of, uh, you know, childhood is a, is a time where you're kind of learning a lot of things. You don't really have a lot of, um, you know, demands or, you know, compared to adulthood, right? You have to make sure your bills are paid and all these, uh, you know, all these duties and responsibilities and so on and so forth. And it just reminds me of being gra a graduate student, sort of, you know, so, you know, the peer when you're doing, you know, so, you know, like, the, being a graduate student, sometimes it could be very difficult, but it's also a time where, wow, you have all this time, you know, especially in the US, for example, you're funded, you, there's, you know, there's a lot of time to think about different things, and you, you don't really have administrative duties, you know? <laughs> you know, you don't have to go to all these different committees, you can just think about ideas and stuff like that. And so the, the, it very much reminds me of that. And so I wonder whether the value is just that, right? Like sort of, uh, children, like graduate students, have this space where they can really explore, they can go in different directions, and they can really, you know, the, there's really an open future for them. And, and that part, that, that's, that, that seems really valuable. And that's something that we try to create in other spaces, but, you know, we don't do it enough because once we become adults, adult, adulting takes over, you know, and then we have to, you know, do a bunch of other things. So anyways, um, and then just to say a bit about uh, children's rights, I think um, uh, one of the things that uh, why I've written about is sort of, uh, 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 you know, whether children have a right to be loved. Uh, and, and, you know, I argue that they do because um, uh, being loved is a human right and human beings have uh, human rights to what I call the fundamental conditions for pursuing a 
good life. And the fundamental uh, conditions are things like being able to think, being able to um, sort of uh, uh, have autonomy, being able to uh, exercise liberty, uh, being able to have friends, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and it turns out that uh, uh, when children are loved, they acquire those capacities to be able to do those things. There's a lot of empirical evidence that support this particular claim. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that, uh, so here I agree with Anka. I think that, you know, if we look at, uh, this is not strictly uh, speaking of well-being, uh, like a sort of uh, a theory of well-being. It's more about sort of, it's a theory of what children have a right to. And it's the same as what adults have a right to. And it's basically this sort of uh, set of fundamental things that uh, they do that allows them to go on and do uh, very, uh, you know, different things. For example, have, uh, you know, have deep personal relationships, being able to pursue knowledge, being able to, uh, appre you know, like create art or appreciate beauty and so on and so forth. And so in, in that respect, I think uh, you might think, um, you know, the, the, the way we assess their well-being or assess whether how well their lives are going, is very similar, uh, whether it's uh, adults or children. So, thanks. Do either of you want to, Patrick, you've unmuted yourself, why don't you jump in? Yeah, so I, I'm going to ask Matthew a question that I know he has answers to, but I just think for the sake of the discussion, it's important to sort of bring out. So Matthew has this view that children have a right to be loved and also that adults have a right to be loved. Is that right, Matthew? Uh, well, the elderly, I just wrote a paper claiming that the elderly have a right to be loved. I don't claim that adults have a right to be loved. What about those of us uh, in the middle? What have we done? <laughs> well, I think that those of us in the middle, it's, it's what you say, uh, Patrick, which is that we have autonomy. And one of the things about love is that it's something, at least adult romantic love, is something that we want to achieve ourselves through our you know, own efforts. And that's why, um, in contrast to, say, parental love, it's, it's a very different type of love. Right, it's more sort of nurturing type of love where someone you know needs to be value you and sort of taking care of you and that type of thing. Um, we as adults we need that as well, but those are things that we can acquire. Um, and typically, we the kind of love that we want are uh, uh, is sort of a kind where we want to get it ourselves. And so that's why, yeah, for that reason, it's different with adults. So. Okay. So now comes the question, though. So um, you know, so rights lots of people think will correlate with duties yeah or implies can so if i have a duty to do something it must be true that i can do it and then you might think that nobody can choose who they love like we all love our kids but we don't choose that we might think so how could we have a duty to do something that we can't choose whether or not we're going to do it yeah. And if we can't have the duty, how can how can they have the right? So I know you have answers to this, but <laughs> I just like to I'd like to hear them again. Yeah, so that's a great question, and it goes with, like it goes back at least as far as uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who says that you know love is a feeling. You know, duties require that you can command, uh, as Patrick was saying, but love is a feeling, and you cannot command feelings, and therefore you can't have a duty to love. And if you think, if you can't have a duty to love, then how can you have a right to be loved? And so my response to that is that, actually that view of love is a very, uh, it's a sort of, it comes from sort of German romanticism, this idea that uh, emotions, feelings, and reasons are really separated. You know, they're sort of, uh, there's like a wall between them or something. And one of the things I argue uh, in, in my book on the right to be loved is that, um, if you take a more Aristotelian approach, right? If you think of emotions as, some, as a kind of disposition, actually there are a lot of things that we can do to bring about emotions at, at, you know, at will. So for example, um, you, know, you might give yourself reasons, right? You, know, you, know, you, you, sort of, you can sort of like, so imagine you're going to a friend's uh, wedding and but on that day you're kind of, um, you know, you're not in a very good mood or you're kind of whatever, but you, you know that your friend would want you to be happy. You can sort of give yourself a reason. You can say, look, my friend would want me to be happy. And so that, that can sort of lead you to have the feelings of like of being happy. Um, same with like, uh, you know, sort of like, and take a case of parenting. Uh, sometimes you can also put yourself in situations where you're more likely. So these are what I call be behavioral controls. Right. So uh, it's a very stressful day. 
Uh, you get snappy whenever you're stressed out, right? So you go home and there's a very uh, likelihood that you'll snap at your children, right? But you don't want to do that. So, but you know that, hey, taking a, taking a, you know, taking a nice bath or just sort of like whatever will make it the case that you're more likely to be warm and responsive to your children. So that's something that you can do again to kind of influence your emotional disposition. And, and then just, you know, and then you can do that across time. So you can kind of cultivate these emotional capacities such that you're more likely to exhibit the right kind of emotions, you know, in appropriate circumstances. Uh, so, so that's, so I think once we take a more a real, a Aristotelian approach where we, you know, recognize that emotion, like reasons can actually influence emotions, then I think this objection tends, uh, I, I tend not to be as worried about this objection, so. But, so perhaps, uh, Anka, do you want to jump in? See you on mute yeah, if, I, if I may bring up another worry about the same kind of objection. So I, I really like, Matthew, your disposition-based accounts of, account of love. And I think, uh, I think it's a very wise way to think about love in general. I totally agree with you that there is a lot, a great deal we can do to make ourselves into more loving people in general and vis-a-vis and -vis certain persons in, in particular. Um, this doesn't fully dispel my worry about the duty to love. And my worry about the duty to love, it's an axiological worry rather than the old worry of you can't have a duty to do something that you can't control uh, doing. So it, it seems to me that not only people in the middle, adults, but people of all ages value love amongst other things very much because it's an affirmation of their value. So the person who loves them for some reason loves them in particular, is partial towards them, wants to hang out with them, it cares about their particular well-being. And it looks to me that we can uh, realize this particular good only to the extent to which the person who loves is not motivated by duty, not even partially motivated by duty. Mm -hmm. Now, this in itself doesn't show that there cannot be conceptual space for a duty to love, but then it will be a strange self-effacing uh, kind of, of duty. So even when you go to your friend's wedding, I guess that realizing the full value of friendship and giving your uh, friend maximal reason to be happy depends on them think, thinking that you were motivated by a desire to hang out with them or mm -hmm. to partake in, in their joy on their wedding day. Yeah. So, um, I think that's, that this is my reason for, so on the one hand, I'm very sympathetic to, to Matthew's um, arguments showing the importance of love for children's, both for children's development and for their well-being for children, independent of how they, they develop in the future. And on the other hand, I find it very hard to admit the conclusion that children have a right to be loved and there are some particular, even potential duty bearers to love each child. Yeah, thanks. So Anka raises a really good question, which is, you know, if your friends, you know, sort of come to your wedding and say, hey, I'm just here because I have a duty to, you know, come to your wedding. That seems, you know, you might be like, well, you know, I don't, you know, isn't it because we're friends? Um, and so, and that's definitely a very valid concern. Uh, the way I think about that is I think um, you can sometimes be motivated by both, right? You can be motivated by both your friendship and because there's a duty. Right. So parents have a duty to take care of their children. I mean, you know, that uh, we, we acknowledge that. And so they can do it out of the duty, but they can also do it out of love. And so I think, you know, so the way I would respond to that is just to sort of say, you know, you, usually we have dual motivations in many other cases. Right. And it seems like in this case, we can also have dual motivation. And it's right that if you're only responding because you think you have a duty then, and you don't really love the child, maybe something is deficient. Uh, but a, a person who does it out of both reasons, uh, that seems uh, okay to me. What do you think, Anka? Well, I think it's even better if you're only motivated by non-duty based considerations. And I, um, yeah, again, it would be a very strange kind of duty, the one that should be self-effacing or if it acts as a second motivator it somehow distracts or at least questions the the full the realization of the full value of love can okay. i ask anka though so when you say it would be better I, I, this is genuinely an open question i'm, I'm not trying to push it but what, what do we mean by better so to better for the child because i mean let's imagine the child wouldn't be able to tell the difference 
maybe they would maybe it's just inevitable that they would and therefore it would be better for the child maybe that's the maybe that's the right answer but well if, if the child cannot tell the difference then there is no problem when the person who loves them is only motivated by duty right okay so it is it purely from because obviously from the outside if you like it looks like something's gone wrong when you know that a parent loves a child because they have this sense of duty that they ought to love the child right so there's lots of other things that we have duties towards our children to do which don't seem problematic that we do it from duty mm. but the idea that we love them yeah regardless of whether we have such a duty the idea that we love them because we have a duty looks like it something's gone wrong there that looks like that doesn't look like a healthy parent child relationship but i'm just wondering if we kind of stipulate in a in a sort of in a philosophical example the child would never know the difference would that would we then sort of think well maybe that makes a difference it, to me that still looks like it, it's something's gone wrong but it's hard to put your finger on what exactly would be the problem there because ultimately what seems to matter here is the child and the child's interest something gone wrong compared to just the parents spontaneously loving the child and not even bringing duty considerations right because it's definitely better to have a dutiful parent who acts lovingly without loving than yes, yeah, so, so, so um, something's gone wrong compared yeah, to the yeah. the picture where the parent just loves the child so the, if the question is what's wrong if the child can't tell the difference, I could answer that I think part of what we owe children is to help them tell the difference when people are motivated by love or by duty or by a mix of these things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Maybe this is a bit cheating in answer to your question, Patrick. Yeah. But it's a very nice answer. Yeah. Uh, can I just say, uh, can I just chime in on this? Um, so I guess I'm still not seeing the force of, uh, you know, sort of being this idea that you have to be mo motivated solely by love. So, uh, and Patrick kind of mentioned this as well. We have so many other, parents have so many other duties to their children, right? They have a duty to feed them. They have a duty to um, educate them, making sure that they're safe, blah, you know, like, and so on and so forth. The, the list just goes down. And um, and part of being a parent is to be responsive to those reasons, right? To act on the, those, like to think, hey, I have a duty to do that. And if I don't do that, I'm kind of being negligent as a parent. Um, but when we do that, we don't think, oh, somehow the parent-childhood relationship is irreparably, you know, like it's damaged because I'm acting out of my duty. We also, of course, we think if parents are only motivated by that and they don't love their children, they don't care about their you know, in some sense at all, then that would be kind of problematic. You know, they, they get, you know, they're like, hey, I'm just feeding you because that's what I have to do, right? Um, or, you know, but, but if we think that, but surely the duty informs a lot of the things of what we do. And we like, and there, I mean, if you just take the other perspective where someone might sort of just really love the, uh, their, their children, but then not fulfill any of these things, Right. And they just say, hey, I really just love you. You know, that's it. You know, and then it's like, well, you know, like they, they don't think about, so that, you know, there are also examples like this. And you might think that that parent is really negligent. There are a bunch of things like it's like, OK, it's great that you love me, but there's, you know, food needs to be on the table. I need to go to school and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. So I, I don't think the issue is that parents would be motivated by duty because we would all agree that there are parents have lots of duties and they ought to be motivated to fulfill them like that i don't think that is a problem i think that the problem that anchor and i are having or the, the worry that we have is when because you're kind of now contrasting when you're motivated by love versus being motivated by duty yeah the worry comes in when the duty is what motivates the love that's that's the worry we have it's just that, right. that loving a child would be that, that you do it because you have a duty to do so mm -hmm. and maybe and, and the, the troubling case is when you would do that only because you have a duty to do so and then firstly you would question is that really love or is that trying to love somebody or is that you know those which you've already pointed toward kind of depends how we understand what love is and I I, I mean I have no answer to that question <laughs> um but um so A would depend on what we understood love to be, but just the, the thought that it's the duty that motivates the love. So it's not that parenting would involve duties that and that has to be the case, but it's that the, the but, but instead of contrasting duty with love, it's more when the duty is the duty to love. That's when it looks like something might have gone wrong in the relationship. And I kind of feel that something's gone wrong in the relationship 
regardless of whether the child can tell the difference, but I'm mm -hmm. quite sure how to put my finger on explain. What, what do you guys think of like, so the marriage vows, right? So the, one of the marriage vows is, you know, have a duty to love until like, you have a duty to love until death do us apart or, you know, like, you know, so, um, but that's kind of, you, you, you express that there's this duty, right? Um, and you might think, well, geez, uh, that's, that's totally against love, right? <laughs> and so you have that duty, like, you know, like, you know, all these people are mistaken. They, they're, in fact, they're saying something where it sort of undermines their love for one another. It should just be spontaneous. So I yeah. think in that case, the duty comes from a promise, right? I think you, pro but it, nevertheless, the same problem applies. I've never thought about it, but now you've said it, maybe I think they are mistaken. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be on the either giving or the receiving end of this kind of, of a vow. I think in the most, this is an expression of, a, it's a form of hope. It's an expression of what people hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the way I make sense of uh, Patrick's puzzle of what goes wrong when it's duty that motivates love. Now love is many things and it's valuable for many reasons, but I take it that now we are talking about that element of love that has to do with attachment. Mm -hmm. Is it even possible to get attached to a particular person out of duty? Maybe it is. Maybe the drive to get attached is so strong in human beings that if you do the right thing, you can engineer an attachment to a particular individual. But mm -hmm. then if you have engineered that attachment, if, you, if, you, if it was your reason that told you you have to get attached to X rather than Y, I think your attachment has, is doing still lots of good things. There's no, no disparaging of this kind of attachment but it fails to communicate that kind of um, special value that the person, that you think the person ha have and in virtue of which you got, you have spontaneously chose them as a, an object of your attachment. Value to you, prudential value to you. Mm -hmm. So if it's the duty motivating love, then it's harder to understand how, how this particular value of love, which is the fact that the lover is personally invested, has their own well-being invested in loving, is uh, is the case and uh, maybe we're just very vain creatures but uh, it, it seems <laughs> like most people really care about being valued by others in this way what do you think of the uh the so people say that uh this kind of love is a western conception this romantic love where you know it needs to be spontaneous and if you think about arranged marriages um you know, around the world, like, you know, in many, many cultures that they, it doesn't, the, the love starting point is not spontaneous. It comes, it, there's a decision. You should, and if you just do sort of reports of these people, they do say they eventually come to love, right? Uh, not all cases, obviously, but many of them do come to love uh, their spouses. Uh, and, um, you know, so, you know, it's, it's not spontaneous. They made a decision at some point, I'm going to love this person, right? Uh, and, um, but on your view, all those uh, arranged marriages would be problematic. And, and you, you, might, you could buy the bullet, you know, um, but it seems like, um, I, I just think that, you know, if, again, if we broaden this notion, and here's, here's another reason why I want to broaden it. Uh, take like, uh, there, uh, you know, some children are adopted, uh, some children are, you know, maybe sometimes you're the step parent, right? And in the case of like step parents, you don't, you might not initially love the your step child, right? But so, uh, many of them do. They come to love their step children by making a decision. And I, I think we need to have a. So I, I think what I'm proposing give, gives room for that. Allow that type of love to be genuine, to be authentic. And not to say, oh, well, it's not spontaneous. You didn't spontaneously love me, therefore you don't love me, right? Now, I, I like this proposal. I don't think that all arranged marriages must be problematic. And I have no worries about the kinds of examples you gave. I, I think that, and I think here I'm on the same page with Patrick. I think in this case, at most, you can make a decision to try to love somebody, as in to see them in the best possible light and to get to know them with an open mind and heart. But I think that getting to love them actually has to do with you responding to something in them that you don't control and the reaction to which you can't fully control. So the happy stories are, are arranged marriages or people, parents not loving their children initially and getting to love them. 
because they were finally motivated by somebody, by something in the beloved, rather than because they were finally motivated by their own ability to see their reasons to love that person, as in reasons that are independent from the reality of the person they get to love, if that makes sense. So if I could, um, in the time remaining, um, move to a somewhat different topic, which is, do parents have the right to inculcate uh, religious views, uh, say their own religious views in their children, or political views uh, along the lines of their own? So that's one question. I, and I suppose maybe a different, broader question is, is, is there a right to be a parent? Um, to be a parent, to be a biological parent, or just to be a parent at all. So um, if anyone wants to address any of these questions, please jump in. Um, Matthew, you're unmuted, is that? Uh... Oh, oh I, I, I hadn't mute myself again, sorry. Uh, but I'm happy to say something. Uh, so I, I, uh, I think that uh, parents, biological parents have a right to parenting, to uh, parent their uh, biological children. And part of this comes from the fact that you know, they're creating a life, you know, sort of, a, you know, someone, you know, like an individual with very special moral status, uh, you know, typically a rights holder, uh, but also the genetic connection uh, and the fact that they, it's sort of a combination of factors and the fact that they're going to raise them and sort of help them nurture and things like that. And why do I think this genetic connection is important? I think it's important, you know, the, I, I sort of, offer kind of an analogy, you might think, well, look, the, the genetic connection is just sort of a bunch of chemicals, right? Um, and why is that, you know, bunch of chemicals? Why is that important? And so I liken it to sort of imagine, you know, it's kind of like coming up with your own ideas in philosophy, right? So imagine that you can just, there's like a, a computer, it gets just press a button, it gives you sort of a new idea, right? You might think, well, it's better if I somehow through my own brain come up with this sort of new idea, right? And it's true, it's just so it's a bunch of chemicals in your head that's sort of like per percolating and sort of you forming this, this idea, but there's something about your connection to that. Uh, there's something about your agency and so on and so forth. And I wanna sort of say similar things about sort of like genetic parenthood, right? Um, and that's not to, and so that, if, if that view is right, then what that means is you have a right to, that, that means you can sort of pre prevent others from trying to parent your biological child. Like I think one of the, th one of the tricky things uh, in this, uh, this area is trying to understand how parents can have a right to kind of prevent others from just like, you know, how, how can I prevent someone from just taking my child home and raise them better than I, I'm doing, doing right now, right? And so if you have this connection, then that gives you sort of a ground for being able to stop people from just sort of taking your children away. So I, I'll, I find this question about biological parenthood fascinating. And I, I, I don't have, I mean, I've, Anka's written some very interesting things on who should have the right to be a parent and, and, and how that should work and that, that, that I've engaged with, but I don't, I find it fascinating, but just from a, almost from a, just to stand outside the debate kind of point of view, um, because before you're a parent, any people becoming a biological parent is so important. And so think, I mean, obviously many people become parents without being biological parents. And I'm sure that all of those experiences are just as wonderful and just, but think about how many of us choose to have bio, our own biological children rather than say to adopt. So often people who adopt, I'm sure some people choose that as a first choice, but often people who adopt will do so after having first tried to become biological parents. Think about how much money people spend on who can't have biological children, their own biological children in a kind of straightforward way and so pay an awful lot of money to try through IVF and what have you so before you have a child because having your own biological child seems really really important and I would say once you have a child to me it seems to not matter in the slightest and so I find that disconnect absolutely fascinating because all the effort that people go through to have their own biological child when we had our first child, because I'm a philosopher and I'm annoying, 
um, I fairly regularly ask my wife, at what point was, if you were told there was a mix up at the hospital and this one wasn't biologically ours, at what point would you be willing to still swap it back? And it was a matter of days. So within days we were saying, we'd rather keep this one that we've now bonded with over any, if we were to find out if biologically it wasn't ours. So it seems to me there's a real disconnect between how people, and there's there's a tragic legal case actually in South Africa where that did happen and the couples had opposing views. So one couple said, I want to, we want to keep the child we've been parenting. And the other couple said, we want the child that's biologically ours. Um, and that's very, very difficult to work out what to do in those circumstances. Now, once you've been a parent for a while, it's obviously in the child's, I mean, there's all these controversial views, like Matthew said, about kind of why can you keep this child? What makes if someone better were to come along? There's a, it fairly quickly becomes the case that it's unlikely, I think, that someone else will be better because children need stability and they need all the things that Matthew was talking about. They need to be loved and they need to be loved consistently and they need consistency in their lives. So I think the chances of someone being a better parent diminish fairly quickly um, over time. However, but that moment in the hospital, if you genuinely could say, look, it's in the child's best interest that this other set of people parent you, why should it be you? And you think, well, but we desperately wanted our own biological child and that really matters to us. But why does that get the say over the interests of the child? Now, here's just a thought. It might be that it's in our own, it's in all of our interests to have a system under which there's a presumptive, and I presume everything Matthew said about a right to stop others, obviously is a presumptive right, providing you're doing a good enough job. Now, of course, some parents clearly should have their children taken away from them in the children's interests, but it might be in all our interests to have this presumptive right to parent our biological children, just because for whatever reason, it really matters to us. And it clearly matters to us through all the kind of ways I've, I've laid out. So it might be in the child's overall interests to, even though they might get better parenting from somebody else, their life might overall go better if they have the opportunity to become a biological parent later, since that is something that matters so much to so many people. So they might get inferior parenting by through this system of letting biological parents keep their children, but overall their life may go better because they'll have the chance later to become a biological parent and that seems to matter to people that they have that opportunity. Anka, do you want to uh, jump in? I'm a bit overwhelmed by uh, being aware that there are three more minutes until we open for questions but I just want to say that I agree very much with most of what Patrick said up to the point of where he presented this lifetime view with which I disagree and I, I explained why. Um, so I, I just want to say two things. One is that um, I don't deny that there may be true that, that biological parents have a, a sort of privilege to be the people who are rearing their children. I don't think it's a claim right. But I think that the best case in favor of this is by appeal to the child's interest, not the interest of the whole human being, where we find a way of weighing the interest of the child in being parented by the biological parent and the interest of the future adult in, in rearing their own uh, biological children, but just the interest of the child. So there is a theory that's quite widespread that biological parents make best parents. It's, a, and it's an empirical claim about which I don't have any particular view. And I'm not quite sure how we're going to settle this empirical claim ever. But if this is true, then it, it's, it's true that in general, it's much better to give biological parents custody over children rather than have some kind of sort of a case court about every newborn and see who wants to re raise the child and, uh, and try to decide on a case by case basis. The other thing that I want to say, and it, this has to do with the questions that, that, uh, that Mike has uh, raised, I think, earlier in the, in the beginning of the session, the question of the, of the right to parent and what kind of thing this is or what kind of interest it protects. I think it protects two very different interests that adults have. One is an interest that I think has a lot of more weight, which is the interest in associating with a child in a long-term caring, nurturing way. It's an interest that has many aspects to it. I think the, the work of Adam Swift and Harry Brickhouse is very good at showing how 
part of the interest is uh, has to do with you taking responsibility, being a parental figure, as it were, for a child. But part of it has to do with uh, the joy of having uh, this type of love in your life. Um, and the other interest is the interest in being an authority figure for the child, as in controlling what happens to the child. And this is a kind of interest that I don't think should figure in in our decisions about uh, adults' associations and, and even less so parental status, associations with children and parental status. So my view is that the moral right to parent is not a claim right, it's a privilege, which is held by the person who's having it is in the best interest of the child. This doesn't mean that everybody else can be excluded from association with the child. It may well be, and I actually believe it's the case, that custodians have a duty to allow other adults to associate with their children who would be in the interest of the child, or at least would not set back the interest of the child, leaving plenty of room for actually more than one adult to be, or more than two adults to be this kind of caring long-term figures in the life of the child. Um, but this, this kind of view definitely doesn't um, uh, assume that there is a, a right that biological parents have qua biological parents and which protects their own interest in, in being the people who control the life of the child. All right, so thank you very much. So we should, um, let's move to uh, the questions now. So first question I'm going to ask uh, is from Susan Kennedy from Santa Clara University, who asks, um, what important differences or parallels do you see between children and the elderly? And this is a question which occurred to me as well. So I was thinking about Patrick's thought experiment where you could really speed up childhood, maybe, or never get through childhood. Um, there does seem to be something wrong with um, being born at 20 years old. Um, is it also important that we go through a period of being elderly and even sort of having our faculties become childlike, or is there an asymmetry? So I'll, I'll open that up. I suppose maybe Patrick, that might be for you. Thanks. Thank you. So I, I think um, this is a really important question. So um, obviously not all elderly people uh, end up with childlike faculties, but m many do and increasingly more uh, as we live longer. Um, and so um, one thing, this is an argument against my or it's a potential argument against my kind of tailoring the account of well-being to the kind of thing that you are or the kind of uh, being that you are sort of idea. So I expressed the worry there that, that that couldn't explain why it would be good or bad for you to um, be rushed into adulthood or to be delayed permanently as a child. Similarly, as someone gets older, imagine two lives of equal length. And as someone gets older in the first life, they maintain all of their cognitive faculties um, and then they kind of um, they die at, say, age 80. And in the second uh, life, in the last 10 years, the person seriously cognitively declines so that they become childlike. Now, according to my sort of view about tailoring the well-being to the kind of person kind of thing you are it looks like we might be unable to say that that second life is worse because it looks like we would be saying well how well off is that is that person now given the kind of faculties and, and abilities that they have um, and so we need a new account of well-being and then we wouldn't be able to say that their life was going worse now because there's just a new account of well-being that now applies and we don't have this overarching account that explains um, why that would be bad for the person. And I think that's a big strike against this kind of approach. Um, so, you know, I kind of open about what I think works with a view and what I think doesn't work with a view. It's not something I, it's actually a, a problem that I myself sort of explained in, a, in an article I wrote um, on this issue. So it's not, um, you know, it, but I'm not quite sure what to say about that other than it looks like a problem for my view. And it comes out from this, this comparison between children and the elderly. But similarly, we might wonder whether Anker's view necessarily can cope with this, or indeed some of the things Matthew was saying can cope with these um, kinds of cases either, because if childhood is great, um, and we want to say, look, a childhood is really good on the kind of 
unified view of well-being. There are things that children access and are able to do um, that, that adults can't. Um, it might be the case that there are things that elderly people who are suffering from dementia are able to access and do that adults can't. You know, if it's really true that they that people as they become older become in some senses childlike, maybe we should be seeing this as a kind of you know a good thing at the end of their lives. So this might pose problems for both approaches, the unified view and the kind of disaggregated view, um, in the sense of how if it's true that we want to say that this is a, a, a bad thing that happens to someone as they become old. And I think a lot of us are tempted to say that. And a lot of us would be tempted to, for example, try and stave off dementia for ourselves prudentially. Um, if we want to say that that's correct, that it's a bad thing that would happen to you and it's something to be avoided, then how does either account manage to sort of deliver that conclusion? Let's, let's move to a, a, another question, try to get through a few questions. Um, so this has to do with the, the wedding example. It's from uh, Facundo Rodriguez from Cambridge, who suggests that uh, maybe the following distinction is worthy of drawing. One can place the duty as the end of the action or as the grounds of the action. By making it the grounds of the action, we can avoid the self-effacing problem. The duty could be to go to the wedding for the sake of my friend. The duty is then not part of the action. It is go to the wedding for the sake of your friend. Kantians usually distinguish between the motive and end and the grounds of the action. The duty could be to do something with a particular end and motivation. So does anyone want to comment on that suggestion? Uh, I just want to say I, I like that suggestion. And so that's how I think of a duty. Uh, sort of it's a very Razian view where duties are reasons for action. So it's kind of like what um, um, what the, the, the questioner uh, 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 is suggesting as well. So this idea that, you know, yeah, it's a reason for action rather than something, the end of the action. So, um, and then I was thinking that you can have multiple reasons for actions, right? Multiple reasons to provide lo love for, uh, you know, the child. One is because you have a duty and the, the other one is because you love the child. And so those are two different reasons, two different ways by which you can be motivated to provide that love. Yeah. Great, good. So um, next question um, from Arya uh, Makani Birkbeck. If we accept that children have a right to be loved, what do we do in cases where they're stuck with parents who do not love? Is this an argument for licenses? Um, does anyone want to jump in? Anka? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to say so. I'm, I'm not somebody who thinks that children have a love, a right to be loved, but I think they have a very powerful interest. And it is a problem for me because I think that rights do protect very powerful interests. So my own solution to, to this worry, this ties in with something that Patrick said earlier. Once a child lives with a particular set of parents, even very suboptimal parents, it's a, it does a lot of damage to the child to have this relationship interrupted if they are attached and if the relationship is not really below a certain, a certain um, uh, level of, uh, of decency. And then my own solution to this kind of uh, dilemmas is to say, well, make sure that children have more bad people involved in their lives in a lo loving capacity than only their parents. Uh, we can think creatively about a secular version of the good parenting practices that some traditional communities have. Or we can think about um, other ways of encouraging more communal child rearing in which children do get to have relationships with more adults than their parents over the course of their childhood, relationships that are not under the control of their parents, that's very important. And this is going to maximize all children's um, chances to be loved amongst other things and to enjoy other goods that they enjoy when they have stable caring relationships. Good. So, so I, I, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I, it just this might sort of be partly where we might agree on a right to be loved, because before we were imagining that the right to be loved meant that the parent had a duty. But I think what Anka just said points out that the right to be loved could just be, I mean, although Anka just said she doesn't think they have such a right, the right to be loved could could correlate with a duty to ensure that the child is loved, not that you yourself love the child. Now, all that's then required is that there's someone there who will love the child. And empirically, that will be the case. Like almost, so it would only be in cases where 
there would be nobody who would be with, who was able to love the child. So Anka maybe gives us the answer here that the right to be loved. I mean, this might not be the answer that Matthew wants, but the right to be loved might correlate not with the duty to love, but the correlate with the duty to ensure that the child is loved. And then you just have to make sure that you give the child access to people who will love them. I, actually, I should maybe I can jump in here. That's ex exactly what I argue in my book. <laughs> so I argue that everyone has a duty, you know, like has this reason, uh, at least you know, you know, potential reason to love uh, children. And I, and and in the book, I actually uh, sketched um, some what I call the multi-parenting, you know, approach, where it's what Anka is saying that you know we should expand the number of people who provide love for children, right? To you know, there are like many other societies who do that. And we should we should look into that. But I also said that we should do it not just through biological links, but also non-biological ones. Like there could be non-romantic, uh, maybe friends who want to get together and parent a child, and we should allow for that type of arrangement. But just to be clear, there's a, there, I mean, there's a not a very important, but there is a philosophical difference here between everyone having a pro tanto duty to to love versus uh, having nobody having a duty to love. But some people having a duty to ensure that the child is loved. That's a slightly different thing. And it gets you out of these problems of having to say there's a duty to love, which is what conceptually we were finding problematic. May I just quickly add, Patrick, I don't think the duty is to ensure that the child will be loved. It's a, it's a duty to ensure that the child will have adequate opportunities to being loved. There's still a gap. So here's a uh, question which is somewhat related from uh, Christina Easton. Hello, Christina, uh, formerly of the LSE and now war. A clarificatory question for Matthew. You mentioned a right to friendship. Is it just children that have a right to friendship, uh, not adults? Does this explain why in schools it's not inappropriate to force children to hang out with each other and exclusion is counted as a type of bullying, whereas many would think this inappropriate for the office in an adult setting? Uh, great. Uh, if I said that there's a right to friendship, uh, I didn't intend to say that. So I think that uh, what I was trying to say was that uh, having friendship is, a, is one of the basic activities. Have, having deep personal relationship is very important for human beings, qua human beings. Um, and it's a separate question of whether they have a right to it. I, it as a matter of fact, I don't think they have a right to it. For, uh, it's similar to romantic love. Friendship is something where we want to acquire ourselves, right? So forcing people to be friends with each other, that seems like that just undermines the, the, the point of friendship. Um, so, um, but nevertheless, uh, having deep personal relationships uh, is important for everybody, so. Right, so we're nearing the end. So do, do either of you have any parting thoughts, perhaps on, on any of the questions that have come up? To this point or anything else um patrick i could say something that i find quite fascinating about these debates in general is that um firstly that our kind of model of how we parent obviously you live with parents differently but our model of kind of parental rights and the idea that children are raised by a small number of parents um it's pretty fixed within society and it's quite interesting to me the extent to which philosophical ideas about parenting and children's rights go way or often seem initially like they go way outside of these kind of sort of agreed upon practices that we have and it makes me it's just quite an interesting like relationship between the philosophy and the practice here and especially because many of the philosophers who are parents will sort of tend to themselves be parenting in these like relatively traditional ways and, it, and it, this kind of ties into my comments about biological parenting as well, right? So there's a, there's a question about to what extent do we need to try to do justice to these things that we live and do? And to what extent do we kind of think quite radically about them? But what I often find is that when people are thinking very radically, someone mentioned parental licenses, for example, or when we think talk about the best available parent, when people seem to have very radical ideas that go way beyond sort of our normal practices, often we'll find that somewhere down the line they'll be reined in fairly radically. So for example, people who propose parental licenses often end up the license, like what you need to do to get the license doesn't seem that, that onerous at the end of the day. 
but it starts out with this very kind of thing of like, well, we let people drive. We don't let people drive without a license. Why would we let anybody loose on a kid without a license? Which makes a lot of sense. But then when you actually get to the end of the, the, the chain of thought, it seems like the, the proposal isn't as radical as it started looking out as. I don't know if this reflects just my little bit of reading in the literature or whether Matthew and Anka would agree with that characterization. But I just think there's quite an interesting relationship between the philosophy and the practice here. Um, but the philosophy often seems really quite radical and goes way beyond or way outside of what we would normally think of as parenting and the family structures that we're used to yeah anyway that's just a that's a, a kind of not really a thought even it's just a half-baked kind of observation but I'm just I'm fascinated by this whole area of philosophy partly for that reason and I think my kind of puzzlement about biological parenting which I was kind of talking you through earlier is a good reflection of where I feel that puzzle yeah and I'll just chime please yeah both of you chime in with some last oh one. Uh, what uh, last just on what Patrick's saying and that's why I sort of defend this sort of the right of biological parents to uh, parent their own children because I think that blocks the licensing move because they have this you know sort of they initially they have this right it's presumptive uh, of course they're very bad parents then they um, then we can take children away from them uh, as Patrick was saying but because they have this initial right we need to give them the benefit of the doubt initially rather than uh, so rather than have a licensing scheme where uh, ex ante you kind of you know, test everybody to, and decide who's going to be a, an appropriate, you know, parent and then sort of give only those people who are going to be appropriate the right to parent. Right, Anka, the last word. <laughs> yes, also, also in reaction to Patrick, which is a great comment. Uh, so the nuclear family, which looks like so much the natural thing to us, is a very historical way of raising children and apparently not even the one that was uh, dominant for most of the human history. But when you take a more radical approach to it, because you, because you subscribe to certain principles that you would like ideally to see implemented in child rearing, one huge obstacle for in, in, in front of reaching extreme uh, conclusions about how we should reform child rearing is that child rearing is embedded in social life that's um, um, governed by lots of uh, very good principles in, in some respects. And you end up noticing that a type of child rearing that's in line with your revisionist views will require so many other changes in society that you're uh, always feeling very shy to propose offhand just as a way of fixing the way in which you are rearing ch children. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that was a, an, an excellent observation about the disparity between being radical in your principles and very conservative in your conclusions. Right. Well, thank you very much to, to all three of you and also uh, to everyone for your questions. I'm sorry, there are, I see there are lots and lots of questions that we, we could only get through a small number of them. So thanks for joining in. It was a really lively and engaging, thought-provoking discussion. So I'll just say goodbye now. <laughs>